morning. This is the Eager Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors. The Misfee Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community. And The Peppermaster, hot pepper sauces made from farm fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. Well, good morning, and hello, kids, and welcome to season four and episode number 377 of the Daily Beaver Morning Show here on the Cryo Media Network. Yeah, Jesse. Today, recording day is Wednesday, May 8th, 2024, and it is definitely spring here at the Beaver Lodge. Gray and rainy and wet and cold and blah, but hey, the ground still needs a good drink, so bring it on. That's okay. There'll be no tennis for Mr. Beaver today and might have to walk in the rain to get to my uh, physio appointment later today, but hey. It's not like we object to being kept moist. Just saying. All right. I'm your host, the Daily Beaver. Pronouns he, him, hey, Mr. Beaver. Hey, I see you grinning, Mr. Grizzly. <laughs> With me, as always, is my good friend, Mr. Grizzly. A big thank you goes to our podcast funding sponsors, The Peppermaster, The Miss Bee Mysteries from Corporate Moon Publishing. No. Yes. And <laughs> for some reason, I thought I said the Cry Media Network there from Covered Moon Publishing and CanadianTarot.com. Uh, but before we continue with our usual Wednesday show, let's ask uh, Mr. Grizzly how his mental health is doing today as I read uh, Kit Michael going, a bear, a beaver, and a fox walk into a bar. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Can't wait to hear how it ends. <laughs> How's your well, mental health, Mr. Grizzly? <clears throat> I, I just have to say it's probably pretty... Um, I think it's pretty good. I'm not awake at all. I barely slept last night. Took out Miss mm. Lola for a bit, and uh, yeah, Bridget is still sound asleep. She neither one of us slept well. We tossed and turned throughout the night, and and for some reason, I put Lola to bed, you know, properly. Okay, go to bed. You know, and she was all good, happy to do it, and then uh, decided that um, all of a sudden at I don't know midnight, she needed to sleep in our bed. So literally crawled at the end of the foot of the bed and slept there the whole night. Well, that's, that's kind of, she's kind of a big dog and she didn't donut. She kind of stretched across. So mm. neither one of us had a whole lot of room. So we, it was a tossy turny night. Mm. You can have a, a, a beaver, a bear, and a fox. Mm. Um, here's a, here's a beaver, a bear, and a fox. Oh <laughs> my <podcast>. God. <laughs> Where did you get that? Uh, it's a Microsoft AI uh, visual generator. Oh, I love it. You got to send that to me. Okay, sure. Oh, my God, that's so cool. Uh, uh. I love it. I love it. Oh, that's perfect. Absolutely perfect. All right. Um, Mr. Grizzly, do you have something that you want to open with today? Uh, just a second here. I'm just trying to get all caught up. I, I, did, I did read a little bit about um, how Daniel Smith basically pressured the head of the Alberta Energy AESO, I can't remember what the, the acronym means, pressured him into doing the um, halt or pause on renewables. And it really was pressuring him to go along with it. And he wanted nothing to do with it. And um, she seems to be in a little bit of hot water because the receipts are available to be seen. It 
does not look good for her. Oh, tell yeah. me more. Well, let me see if I, 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 I had see it in the, I the narwhal here. Uh, a senior Alberta official story. found the renewables pause very troubling. He was pressured to support it anyway. Internal emails show the head of the Alberta Electric System Operator, that's AESO, mm -hmm. was not comfortable with government's plans to pause renewables. He was told to support the minister without reservation. Oh my. Yeah, according to the, Yeah, according to Drew Anderson at the Narwhal. The president and CEO of Alberta's independent electricity grid operator was pressured to support the provincial government's controversial decision to suspend new renewable energy projects despite his objections to the move, new internal documents obtained by the Narwhal reveal. Mike Law, the top official at the AESO, the organization overseeing the province's electricity grid, was opposed to a moratorium on new renewable energy projects and, quote, was not comfortable supporting the decision, according to the documents. Nevertheless, in July, he was told by his government-appointed board chair to, quote, support the minister without reservation. The documents released, even if there was cause for reservation, I'm guessing, here. Mm -hmm. The documents released through a Freedom of Information request disclose internal correspondence contradicting claims by Alberta Premier Danielle Smith, and that is not a surprise because as we keep on saying on the show, thanks to Nate Pike who told us this, once you first understand that Danielle Smith will first always choose to lie, first always, first always choose to lie, then you can begin to understand her. So, the documents released through a Freedom of Information request disclose internal correspondence contradicting claims by Alberta Premier Daniel Smith that her government's decision to pause renewable energy developments for seven months was partially in response to requests from the operator itself. Mm. Yeah, okay, that was BS. That reminds me a lot of Stephen Harper saying, uh, remember when we're going to change uh, the way we do the census to stuff that you don't have to fill in and just monitoring stuff and, you know, like this. Statistics Canada tells us that that's just as good when Statistics Canada had never said that. No. Munir Sheikh, who was the head of Statistics Canada, and, like, this was his dream job. He had always dreamed of being, being the head of Statistics Canada, actually took his dream job and told Stephen Harper, you can shove it. Mm -hmm. I'm resigning because if it remains part of the public domain, me, the chief statistician of one of the top three statist statistical bodies in the entire world, said that doing it this way rather than the way we're doing it would give us equivalently reliable results. If that goes out, my professional reputation is ruined for the rest of my life. Yeah, he's done. Finished. None of yeah. my peers will believe that that's actually true. They know it's not true, that the, the, result, the results will be, the data will be just as reliable. So I will be a laughing stock for the rest of my life. So in honor and in dignity, in self-preservation, he resigned publicly, causing great humiliation and embarrassment to Stephen Harper. Uh, I am seeing that the head of the AESO probably did not do that in this case. The Alberta Electric System operator asked for us to do a pause to make sure that we could address the issue of stability of the grid, Smith said in August 23. Uh, that should have said Smith lied, not said in August 23. Mm -hmm. When pressed by reporters asking why the government made the decision, add in that the grid's regulator, the Alberta Utilities Commission, also asked for the pause. Quote, the desire to halt the new project pipeline is a very troubling message for me, and it's something we need to provide good messaging against to the government of Alberta when we have the opportunity, Law wrote to his colleagues in June 2023, shortly after hearing about the government's plans. Halting the new project pipeline refers to the renewables pause, which happens, which appears to not have been clearly defined at that time. Law added that the pause, coupled with an inquiry conducted by the regulator, would send industry into a, quote, tailspin. It would, he said in another email to the board chair, send a, quote, closed for business message and would be, quote, reputationally very challenging for the province. Quote, if we make ourselves unwelcoming, investment will just go elsewhere, he wrote. And uh, from pretty what we can tell, yeah, and from what, what we can tell, uh, it has. And uh, then the narwhal uh, includes, uh, Mr. Grizzly, I will put it up there for the kids to see, the actual letter uh, from Mr. Law. Mm-hmm. There we go. FYI, Carl had a conversation with the minister yesterday. The, quote, desire to halt the new pipeline project is a very troubling message for me, and it's something we need to provide good messaging against into uh, government, government of Alberta. Alberta when we have the opportunity. That, coupled with a rumor of an AUC inquiry approach to determining policy change needed, is going to throw industry into a tailspin. AUC inquiries, distribution, smart grid, hydro, etc., etc., have resulted in large amounts of work and no tangible outcomes, which industry will view as a government of Alberta delay tactic, especially if coupled with a new project moratorium of some sort. Signed, Mike. 
Yeah. Yes. His unequivocal opposition came the day after Minister of Affordability and Utilities Nathan Newdorf used his first meeting with Carl Johansson, the chair of the Alberta Electric System Operation, to say he wanted to pursue a pause, again contradicting the government's claims about why it made the decision temporarily suspend project approvals. The meeting took place on June 28, 2023. In response, Johansson, appointed by the UCB government in 2020, warned law events against being too vocal. Quote, I would be careful with your messaging on this, Johnson cautioned in an email on June 29th. This may be a way for the minister to show action, and if he goes this way, we are better off to have a say on the process rather than let Alberta Utility Commissions have sole reign. I agree that it could be a burden, but it's better than an action. Less than a month later, Johansson informed his board colleagues by mail that Newdorf had requested a letter of support from the system operator, something which became central to questions about the pause when the government first announced it in August 2023. Quote, As you can imagine, Mike Law is not comfortable with this, but he has agreed to provide the letter, Johansson wrote on the 19th, July 19th. I told him to support the ministers without reservation. Nothing good will happen if the minister feels that the Alberta electric system operator is not behind the decision. Yeah, nothing good will happen if the minister feels the Alberta electric system operator is not behind the decision. Kind of like a mob boss mentality, don't you think? Yeah. The Narwhal asked Rory Williams, a professor of political science at Calgary's Mount Royal University, to review the documents. Williams said the documents not only directly contradict government statements about why it introduced the pause, but also call into question the independence of the system operator. Gee, you think? Mm -hmm. Quote, this speaks to direct concerted interference, basically shopping for or putting pressure on agencies that are supposed to be independent and insisting that they produce something completely compatible with what the government has already planned, she said. In other words, making the decision first, then putting pressure on experts to support the decision decision that they actually disagree with. And if you think this is new, it isn't because Stephen Harper did the exact same thing when he was prime minister with regard to uh, uh, consumption sites. Mm -hmm. Every single da piece of data he got from international research said that they actually work. So he actually funded the RCMP to conduct their own specific study and hoping that the study would say, hey, they're terrible so that he could point to this, this one study and say, hey, this one study says that it's terrible and it was done by the RCMP. Gee, you know, we have to trust our cops. So, uh, yeah, we're not going to fund these. And uh, even that didn't work out for him. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, this is a, 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 a common tactic, yeah, actually. It's, 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 uh, yeah. uh, Albertans and industry were caught off guard on August 3rd, the day the Alberta government announced a surprise, quote, pause on all new renewable energy projects for seven months, stifling development of wind and solar projects across the province that have surged in recent years. The government cited two letters to justify the decision, one from the Alberta Utilities Commission and the other from the system operator. Both letters were dated July 21st, how convenient, attached to government news release announcing the pause. Quote, this approach is in direct response to a letter received from the Alberta Utilities Commission and concerns raised from municipalities and landholders, the news release said. Neither letter asked for the pause, but simply acknowledged that the government's intentions, simply acknowledged the government's intentions. Previous documents obtained by the Narwhal show Newdorf showed up for his first meeting with the regulator, regulator ready to talk about a renewables pause the day after meeting with Johansson. The newly released documents show that the two viewed the minister's interest in a renewables pause. In early July, the board chair sent a text message to law after meeting with the minister. He said they talked again about a pause, which he wrote, quote, seems to be an attractive option for the minister. Quote, my perspective is this is not the best approach, but I will be sensitive to ministerial desires, law wrote in reply. The internal communication between Law and Johansson also indicate the operator was caught off guard by the push for a pause and that its letter signed by Law was provided only after pressure was applied by the government-appointed board chair. And again, they include the email in uh, the article if you're going to watch it, read it. The moratorium was lifted in February and new regulations were put in place limiting where and how renewable projects could be developed. Williams said the documents are evidence of direct pressure from the government and from someone appointed by the government. Johansson was appointed board chair in 2020, but the United Conservative Party government under Jason, by the United Conservative Party government under Jason Kenney, which moved quickly to stack boards across the province with hand-picked candidates. Williams said it is concerning the government pursued the policy, even though experts warned about investment impacts. Quote, the question again becomes, why the moratorium? Why was that necessary? What is the damage that was done by this that the government was warned about in advance and chose to ignore, she asked. Law was not available for an interview, but Janice Coffin, the Director of Communication and Stakeholder Relations for the System Operator, sent an emailed statement attributed to Law. Quote, 
After internal discussions in keeping with our mandate, the AESO provided our independent advice to the government of Alberta to help them make an informed decision, and once that decision was made, the AESO supported the policy direction of the government, the statement said. Coffin did not respond to the novel's request to speak with Johansson. The government also did not respond to a request for an interview with Newdorf, Minister of Affordability and Utilities, prior to publication. Yeah. She lied. She lied. She just and has been caught with her hand in the cookie jar. I just say it's it's the duplicit, duplicity of the oil barons who pull her strings, and she's been caught. And they, they tried to confront her about this the other day, and she just sidestepped the question, didn't answer it at all. Oh, that's what that thing was about on mm-hmm. Nate's page. Yep. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Didn't answer a thing. I, didn't I, answer I, a thing. I remember seeing that where, uh, yes, they uh, asked, uh, yes, yes, yes. I remember seeing that. They asked her and it's pretty much like, oh, well, yeah, sure. You know, well, oh, look, yeah, the way he, he states it, it I was going to say, yeah, sure, I lied. But more like it was like, oh, look, maybe it wasn't AESO. But this one time I did a tour and asked five technicians if the power grid would work better if it was more stable. And they all nodded. Mm-hmm. Well, except that that's not the same question now, is it? Uh, no, no, it isn't. It is. Would the power grid work better if it was more stable? Well, duh, of course it would. Anything that's more stable tends to work better. That's like this. You didn't specifically ask, hey, if we cut off all support for the renewables industry, would mm-hmm. our power grid work better? Here's the clip. Because she's really focused on baseload, but of course mm-hmm. she doesn't have the capacity to actually generate new baseload because Alberta, despite eight or nine years, depending how you count it, of the entire NDP and liberal coalition that hasn't existed for nine years. But hey, let's skip details. After both of them wrecking havoc on Alberta for nine straight consecutive years, Alberta has never pumped more oil and has never been at more peak capacity. So clearly she's got the room for all that additional base load. Mm. There's all this excess capacity not being used yeah anyway let's see uh the lie <clears throat> about iso the narwhal was reporting this morning that new voice documents from inside iso showed that the ceo was not on board with any renewables pause mike law said that it would throw the industry into a quote tailspin so why did you say why did the premier say that iso had asked for this pause Look, I mean, look, what we had heard in our conversations with the electric system operator is that we needed to explore how to integrate a responsible amount of solar and wind into the system. And quite frankly, seeing over a dozen near misses on our power grid validates that we need to figure out how to integrate these. What happens, and I visited the electric system operator control room, it's about five guys who are watching what's happening with wind and solar, and they have to amp up uh, natural gas when wind and solar suddenly come off. And I asked all of them, I said, would this be a little bit easier if we had reliable power? And every single one of them nodded their heads. So we have to figure out a way to get a more reliable market. And that is going to be the next stage of our development. So I would say that the facts uh, speak for themselves, that we used to go uh, years without having a, a power grid near failure and now we've had multiple in the last short while and a lot of that is because of the intermittency of power that comes on and off without predictability and can't be dispatched so i whatever they're they're uh, suggesting um, i would have to beg to differ that my job is to make sure the power grid doesn't fail and it has. Uh, if solar and wind policy needs to be changed so that it can be integrated better with our system and we can bring on base load power that's my job to make sure we do Everything that you've done on this file up until now has resulted in disaster calamity or excess costs, including 128% increased costs in electricity from July the year before to July of last year. Everything you have done has been not, has been to make the case that you need more baseload power but you haven't actually done anything to generate more baseload power. Yeah, it's... You lie. And she got caught in her lie. Yeah. Let's stick with Alberta for a minute. Um, 
I have a video clip here that I don't know if you've seen. It's about Alberta MP Arnold Viersen. I, oh, I this guy. Did yeah, I say yeah. his name correct? Yeah, let, 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 let's hold off on him for a second because okay. yeah, we need to talk about him. Um, according to Nate from The Breakdown, uh, he also has another tweet. Oh. That, that Yes, that came out. Uh, the one with uh, this video came out May 3rd at 7.23 p.m. But uh, May 3rd at 11.32 p.m., so about mm -hmm. four hours later. K, for reals though, if any ASO operator who was there for Smith's tour comes forward and says they didn't nod, that would be just the absolute cherry on this train wreck. Now, wouldn't it? <laughs> I asked five guys in the control room and they nodded that more stability would make the grid work better. I took that. I passed it through the UCP Bullshitatron 3000 beep, boop, 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 beep, and came up with, they told me we absolutely needed to do this or else the whole oil industry would die. Basically. Speaking yeah. of shit. Um, now, uh, yeah, let, let, let's go to Mr. Arnold because. Well, quick story and then we'll go to Mr. Arnold. Okay. <clears throat> So, so last night we, I get home from work and, uh, take uh, Ms. Lola out for dinner, uh, dinner, walk. We're out for about an hour, met some friends. She played, it was great. And then walk back in the house. I open the door and I go, Jesus Christ, what does that smell? Did she take a shit in the house? And Bridget's like, no, that's dinner in the slow cooker. <laughs> I'm like, oh, uh. Smell, smells great. <laughs> she proceeded to piss herself laughing. <laughs> She's laughing Jeez. about it right now. It just was a strong aroma when I walked in. It hit me like a ton of bricks, and I thought maybe the dog had dropped a deuce. No, no, it was a, an African uh, peanut stew. It was actually very, very good, but it just had a very strong, uh, pungent aroma, and I mistook it for the dog making a mess. When that was not the case. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, so we, go uh, clip? <laughs> we have Arnold Vreesen, who I like to refer to as DJ Homo Milk or MC Homo Milk. Oh my God. Um, he's the tall drink of water who uh, many years ago did that very, 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 very terrible, very ill advised <laughs> rap, rap video. Very. Uh, and he will never live that down. No, it's like, who, who said, yeah, that's a good idea. I'm like, dude. You, you have no rhythm again whatsoever. That video is proof that Arnold Vreesen does not know any black people. Clearly. At all. Because they would have told him. Yeah. Just saying. All right. So this guy um, had some thoughts mm -hmm. on um, women's reproduction that he thought would be wise to share. Let's just Out loud, get this recorded, where we could see them, In the and they'd be captured forever. Uh, the honorable member of Peace at River Westlock. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and I want to uh, present a petition today signed by Canadians from across the country. Uh, these Canadians are concerned about the nearly hundred thousand preborn children who die every year uh, since the Morgenthaler decision. Canada is only one of two uh, nations in the world that have zero uh, laws protecting the preborn. Uh, uh, they, they also note that a uh, child's heartbeat begins when the child is uh, six weeks old and they are calling on the government of Canada and this place to strengthen the protections for the preborn in Canada. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Present by the Honourable Member of Peace at River Westlock. Well, thank you. Okay. Control now, women's bodies. First thing, he says re or re-strengthen protections mm -hmm. for the preborn in Canada. There are no provisions to protect the preborn in mm. existence to strengthen in the first place. Correct. The way that he formulated his questions presupposed this uh, that this actually already existed in the law to be strengthened. It doesn't. It's just, it's a slippery slope to outline abortion is what it is. It's all it is. Preborn 
figures nowhere in our mm-hmm. criminal code. No, zero. Nowhere. It figures nowhere in our civil code. There has never been a law to strengthen protections for the preborn. We already have a word for preborn humans. They're called fetuses. Mm-hmm. Fetus. There are no fetal rights. And he says that heartbeats after six weeks, it can't survive outside of the womb after six weeks. Yes, but that's again a reference to the six B, six weeks or the heartbeat bills in the United States going the way of Florida, mm-hmm. which, you know, uh, because in, if, you, if you've if you been paying attention now, Florida used to be the place that everybody in the South of the United States could go to to mm-hmm. get abortions. And now they're down to a six week. So it means that everybody in the South of the United States now, you, the only place that you have left to go is if you're in Florida, you have a 14 hour drive to North Carolina. I believe where you mm. can go get one, uh, or somewhere. There's other places. Several, that you can, several so, hours, there's a couple yeah. of other places that you can go. But if you're more than twelve weeks, and you don't, you probably don't know after six. And chances are you don't know much more after twelve. But after twelve weeks, the only place you can go is North Carolina. That's a fourteen-hour drive. There's a couple of other places you can go before twelve weeks, but that's it. Well, and and all of the southern after US. six weeks, there's no heart, and and. Most women don't know that they're pregnant after six weeks. Yep. And correct me if I'm wrong. Please correct me if I'm wrong, because clearly I'm a man talking about a woman's body. I don't want to do that, but let's get facts straight. Let's get yeah. facts straight here. Come on. Yeah. And then, uh, as start, then come on, come on. Ms. Says, and as Ms. Shadika says, I'm confused because when I had a miscarriage in my teens, the day before it happened, they picked up a heartbeat and I was only five and a half weeks. And uh, yeah. Mm. And that's the other thing you got to worry about too is miscarriages. Right. Because um, for some of these people, it doesn't matter why the baby wasn't born. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that doesn't matter to them. Because if you uh, slipped and fell or something, and something happened to the baby, did you abort it? Mm-hmm. Law is not particularly clear on that. Yeah, so he's just trying to police women's bodies is all he's trying to do. Yeah. That's all he's trying to do. Yeah, absolutely. Now, this is particularly interesting because, as we mentioned, Pierre had a little moment in front of the Canadian Police Association stating that he would... Um, when he was prime minister, he would uh, pass constitutional laws, or at least laws that he would make constitutional, constitutional yeah. using whatever provisions the constitution allows him to access, if we know what he means. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. And of course, well, what he means right, is the use of the not with standing clause. And Arnold Viersen has been really busy because uh, just the other day, uh, he was trying to convince his common colleagues, according to uh, um, Katie O'Malley, to support his backbench bid to add a new criminal offense for anyone who makes or distributes pornographic material without making sure that each person depicted in the material is 18, age, 18 years of age or older and has given their express consent to their image being depicted. So while this particular thing is not a bad thing, this, you will notice that uh, the conservatives, once again, they're using their back and peas like this to talk about sex, porn, genitals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And abortion. They, w- they want to bring it in through the back door when nobody's looking. Okay. So, and that was not an innuendo. That was not a, I was not going there. Okay. Just literally, they want to sneak it in the back door when no one's looking. Yeah. So, we had uh, Poliev, you know, share his plans with the police. And then, of course, well, you know, news about that got out. And he got some backlash, I would suspect. And then he came out the next day pretty much saying that, oh, no, 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 don't, don't worry about it. I, I will only use this 
I will only use this, I promise, for things having to do with matters of criminal justice. Said, but a couple days later, there's a backbench MP standing up in the House of Commons mm -hmm. talking about abortion, talking about rights for the preborn. It's all kind of fishy, don't you think? Which causes me to ask the question, even though um, he, Pierre promised us up and down, it's right here in the Globe and Mail, conservatives say Pierre would only override charter rights for criminal justice matters. Published May 3rd. Um, if that's true, why do you have a backbench MP talking about abortion? Because uh, from where I sit, that gives me all those icky, you know, cold thing going up and down my spine, skin crawly feelings that, you know, you're just saying that. You're just saying it's only going to be criminal. Justice matters. That wouldn't be any other aspects of our life that you would like to expend, expand that temporary suspension of rights using the notwithstanding clause, passing laws that you will make constitutional. Mm -hmm. mm. According to the Globe and Mail, a day after declining to put any limits on how, and at first, right, your first instinct, a day after declining to put any limits on how the conservatives would use the notwithstanding clause if they form government, the party now says leader Pierre Polyev would only use the tool to override chartered protected rights when it comes to matters of criminal justice. And if you believe that, once again, I have some oceanfront property on the north coast of Alberta or Saskatchewan to sell you. Yeah. yeah. Because that little intervention from Mr. Reason uh, contradicts that. No federal government has ever invoked the clause, but Mr. Polyev says he would change that. Until Friday, neither, nee or, neither he or his party outlawed any limits to when and how he would use the clause, which has been called the nuclear option because it gives the government the power to override constitutionally protected rights. When it was crafted, it was believed elected officials would use it sparingly, but its use has been on the rise provincially. Quote, a common sense conservative government will only use the notwithstanding clause on matters of criminal justice, Mr. Polyev's spokesperson Sebastian Skamsky again said in a statement to the Globe and Mail on Friday. It is unconscionable that any government would allow a mass murderer like the Quebec mosque shooter to ever be released from prison. He murdered six innocent worshippers in an act of hate, and the only way he should ever leave prison is in a box. Coming mm -hmm. and using that colorful rhetoric again. And of course, you see that they automatically go to the mosque shooting, exploiting another tragedy. Yes. Because when we know they don't give two shits about Muslim people. They don't. No. Because, they will and, use them as a cudgel and then throw them under the bus once they're done with them. And here's the other irony again, because uh, you got this guy saying, oh, no, 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 no. We will use the, the we will use the notwithstanding clause only on matters related to uh, justice which is probably the most dangerous part. You do not want a government determining which cases are pursued, who gets parole, who gets transferred, who gets bail. Who does. You don't want that on a case-by-case -case basis. You want your general overall principles of law, but you don't want a government intervening in every case the way that this one does. That's the whole reason that sent them climbing the curtains for SNC, was a government involved in a, a case, allegedly. Mm -hmm. And here they are, they're saying like this, in matters of criminal justice, we will directly as a government interfere. That's not good. We will suspend your rights, right? This is not, and he's, so he's saying this, right? At the same time, as he's saying, th this is the same leader that said um, on matters of uh, personal rights and stuff like that, when Quebec introduced Bill 21, uh, no, 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 I wouldn't intervene. I would just let the provinces do. Mm -hmm. Sure he would. Sure he would. But he won't let his MPs go to the World Economic Forum. So he'll let the provinces suspend, for example, if you happen to be practicing the wrong religion, because you do not get the same access of, to government employment as everybody else, but you get the privilege of paying the same taxes as everybody else. He's okay with that. Let the provinces do what the provinces will do. Mm -hmm. 
but oh, on matters of criminal. No, 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 no. If you start in one area, you will expand it to other areas because the whole principle of this law or this change is people that you find scary, mm -hmm. people that you find socially irredeemable, you know what? I'm going to keep them down for you. Well, the people that you don't like and the people you find scary, eventually that bar slowly starts to go down to cold-blooded multiple mm -hmm. murders, murderers. Yeah. To people, to men who suck dick. That's what's, you know, it... it to women... It's a sliding scale, right? To people born presenting biologically female who like to wear pantsuits a little too much. Mm -hmm. To um, phys ed and drama teachers yes. who might be a little too masculine or feminine. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, they already tried that in Alberta with the school board, right? Yes, that's why I'm bringing it up. We did that uh, whole we're, story we're on We're relating it. it to stories that we... It's a slippery slope. What it is, is they will get in there and they will make the changes the way they see fit. And the next thing you know, you have been robbed of your rights that were hard fought and won for you. You know, those, those things you used to, you get those coloring books with games in it and you had all the little dots and you, then you had to connect the dots. Right now they're laying out all the dots. Yeah. We, we're connecting they're, for you. Like so this, you we're connecting. They haven't connected them yet, but oh yeah, we're talking, Arnold Vreesen is talking about abortion over here and uh, over there. They're talking about uh, trans kids being having the right to access medical care. Medical care, and Sorry. over here uh, we're talking about oh, why do they have to shove the pride parade down our throats all the time? And over here they're talking about this. They're laying down all the dots, mm -hmm. but they're not talking about them yet, like they're connected. And I stand corrected. Thank you, Cassie. That was the Manitoba School Board, and it passed. Yes, Manitoba School Board. And, and, well, this is an interesting statement from James. Abortion is not a right. You are correct. It's a medical procedure. That's it. It's a medical procedure in Canada. That's why there's no laws around it. The minute okay. you put a law around it, they can start to augment and change the laws, which is why in France they made it a constitutionally protected right. But mm. in Canada, it is simply a medical procedure. Like it or not. That's mm -hmm. what it is. You don't have to be pro-abortion and be pro-choice. You do understand that there are nuances and differences in the two. You can be anti-abortion and pro-choice. I know that sounds crazy, right? But here's the thing. You don't want an abortion, don't get one. Right? That's your choice for you. And that's your choice. Your choice for you. That is pro-choice. I have chosen not to have one. That person may cho choose to have one. I have no say in that. I don't have to walk in their shoes or live their life or support that child. But hmm. nobody ever takes any of that into consideration. You can I, be anti-abortion and pro-choice at the same time. You don't have to like decisions other people make. That's right. But you can still respect their right to have the choice to make them. Exactly. That's the difference. Well, and, there's difference this, right there. and, while, while, and while abortion is not a right, healthcare is pri a right. Privacy is a right. Healthcare is a right, mm -hmm. right? The right to not have, you know, uh, you know, people touch your body or not to touch your body according to, right? We do, there There are adjacent rights. Yes. Yes. Abortion itself is not a right. No. Mr. Grizzly is absolutely correctly correct. That is why we have no provisions of the law, like in the United States, where they want to regulate it, because once they determine 16 weeks, well, why not 12? Yeah. Why not six? Why not five? Let's start. Well, you heard what let's just let's said. debate this. Yeah. Why? Why don't you want to have a debate? Why don't you want to have a talk? Because the purpose of the debate is to try to make a case for whittling away rights. Well, and that's why a lot of people are not interested in having it. You know something. But else. you owe me a debate. No, we don't. No, we don't. Actually, the the yeah. slippery slope is first they start to control women's bodies from this aspect. Then birth control is next. Okay, that's next. Then what comes after that? Bodily adornments, tattoos. They will outlaw tattoos. You think I'm being ridiculous? These people are dominionists. They're not good people. 
They want to rule over you in every way, shape, and form. I'm not being hyperbolic. This is all part of their bigger picture. We're connecting the dots for you. Am I being conspiratory? No, I'm not. It's all out there in the ether. Just look for it, man. This is what they want. And they start. They start by taking over school boards. Yep, indeed. So uh, according to the Globe and Mail, uh, on Thursday, Polyev's office initially did not announce answer four direct questions about Mr. Polyev's plans, including if he would only use the clause in the realm of criminal justice or in other areas as well. The Globe also asked if the conservative leader thought there were any charter-protected rights that a government should not override with the notwithstanding clause. His office first sent a statement that did not answer the questions and then sent a second statement later Thursday saying only that the conservatives' focus was on criminal justice matters. Uh, Their phones were ringing off the hook on this one. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason why he's trying to say limited only to that is because uh, he knows that going further, at least saying that he will want to go further, uh, is political suicide, but that he's maintaining the line on still wanting to go that far. Yeah. Indicates that the phone calls didn't chastise him enough. And if the phone calls did not chastise him enough to walk away from the entire policy, because, you know, while I can think personally on a one on one basis for me, for example, something that would be worse, example, for example, reversing same sex marriage. Because I don't plan to do anything that is going to land me in jail. Unless they start changing some laws and saying that some of the things that I say today are no longer things that I'm allowed to say. Um, you know, I'm not, I could sit here at home and go, well, you know, I have no plans to break the law. I'm a pretty law abiding person, so I don't need to worry. I'll never be in the situation that Paul Bernardo's in. Um, Wanting to override the Constitution on matters of criminal justice, of all things, is the worst one you could go for first. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. He's literally said, when I am prime minister, I will be judge, I will be your judge, your jury, and your jailer. He didn't say executioner because he's not ready to float that one out there, but I bet you he is. Yes. Well, he didn't say judge, jury, and jailer too. But the other no. day I was saying judge, you know, he's making himself judge, jury, and executioner, except we don't have the death penalty. Mm -hmm. So judge, jury, and jailer. I have a, a video clip here Saucy just sent me of uh, her, the, the, the woman speaking. You've seen her. We know her. We love her. I can't remember her name. It's Jane. I'm drawing a blank. This is one minute and 33 seconds. You need to watch this because this spells out um, Pierre Polyev, his party, and what they're doing and what they're talking about. This is, this is important. And right now, white people are really frightened. If you don't understand the destruction of Planned Parenthood uh, offices, and you don't understand the wall that we're going to build on the southern border of the United States, you haven't read the book The Birth Dearth by Ben Wattenberg. Ben Wattenberg was a brilliant Jewish man who was a member of the American Enterprise Institute. And he wrote a book, the first paragraph of which says, the main problem confronting the United States today is there aren't enough white babies being born in this country. He was an advisor to presidents of the United States. He wrote the book in 1987. He says there are, if we don't change this and change it rapidly, white people will lose their numerical majority in this country and this will no longer be a white man's land. Now, I'm not misrepresenting, misrepresenting this. I'm telling you exactly, almost exactly what he says. He says there are three things we can do to solve this. Number one, we could pay women to have babies as they have been doing in Western European nations for years. Then he says, and these are his words, not mine, unfortunately, we would have to pay women of all colors to have babies, so we don't want to do that. He says the second thing we could do is increase the number of legal immigrants that are allowed into this country every year. Then once again he says, unfortunately, the vast majority of those wanting to come to this country today are people of color, so we don't want to do that. The third thing he says, and white men, women had better pay attention to this, 60% of the fetuses that are aborted every year are white. If we could keep that 60% alive, that would solve our birth dearth. Does that sound like racism to you? And if it doesn't, I want to know why it doesn't. Jane Elliott, once Dang. again, bringing it home, spelling it out, and knocking it out of the goddamn park. Dang, Jane. She is never wrong. 
she isn't. And some people get really upset at what she says because she always tells you the truth. She is one of the most brilliant individuals I've ever heard speak on matters of race and, and how she has a whole series called Blue Eyes. I'm sure you've seen it. Yes. Yes. Blue Eyes versus, yeah, brown eyes. And- yes. And, and she has white people literally dropping down, breaking down, crying because they're discovering for the first time in their life what it's like to not be white. What it's like, well, and, you know, they haven't changed their skin color, obviously. Yeah. But in, in the experiment, it's like, this is what a person of color is treated like every day of their lives. You couldn't handle it for five minutes in an experiment controlled in a classroom setting. There's this, a, a documentary called, I think it's called Blue Eyes from Jane Elliott. Mm-hmm. Google it, watch it. it it's, uh, pardon the pun, eye-opening. Yes, but it makes it very clear that there's a lot of us that would not at all, willingly. A lot of us that say, hey, we're an equal country and everything's great. A lot of us really, really wouldn'tly want to change places no. with the other people. And if you do not willingly want to change places with someone else, then chances are it's because you know. You know. Remember Chris Rock you just made don't the want famous to say statement? It. Chris Rock made the famous statement, there's not a white man in America that want to change places with me, and I'm filthy fucking rich. Right? Wouldn't give up. Wouldn't give up that trailer park to be a rich black man. What does that tell you? And this falls right in line with what Pierre Polyev is saying and doing. Yeah. It, Polyev talks about immigration, how they want to limit the numbers. They want to, they want to ban abortion so that they can uh, increase the number of white babies. In this. this is all part of their plan. I am not being alarmist or hyperbolic in any way, shape, or form. It's all out there. Nobody's connecting the dots. We're trying to do that for you. And we'll continue to do that for you. I have to grab another cup of coffee and we got to wrap up shortly. I will be right back, sir. Okay. Um, I got into a conversation the other day uh, asking why it is, um, or not asking why it is, but uh, asking me uh, to uh, spend more time on my podcast uh, denouncing um, hate that seems to be coming from the left. Um, I, I, you know, and rather than reporting on the PR stuff and I made the comment that, um, I don't have to choose between doing either because we do both on the show. Um, we have talked about hate coming from the right. We've talked about hate coming from the left. Um, you know, there's fewer incidents of one than the other, but we do talk about it. Uh, and um, I understand, right, when we have stuff that's going on uh, thousands of miles away and uh, passions are inflamed here and then we act on it, um, that if we talk about one side one day, it could make people think who don't follow the show like this, that we only talk about that side or we don't. But we do talk about both. And um, we have a story here that's concerning to us because according to the B'nai B'rith, they uh, released a report on May 6th and says that the number of anti-Semitic incidents reached a record high in 2023 in Canada. Quote, in its latest annual audit, B'nai B'rith Canada reports the number of anti-Semitic incidents in the country more than doubled from 2022 to 2023 and has now reached a record high. Quote, if a physical barometer did in fact exist, the reading for 2023 would be off the chart, Richard Robertson, the group's director of policy and research, said in Ottawa on Monday, which was also also Holocaust Holocaust Remembrance Day, or Yom HaShoah. So that was uh, on on the 6th uh, this week. B'nai B'rith, a Jewish advocacy organization, said that between January 1st, 2023 and December 31st, 2023, it logged 5,791 incidents of anti-Semitism surpassing the previous record of 2,799 reported in 2021. Let me repeat that. Logged 5,791 incidents surpassing the previous record of 2,799. It's more than doubled. Mm. 
Robert said, said he's particularly troubled by the 208% increase in the number of violent incidents, with 77 such incidents recorded last year compared with 25 in 2022. Quote, the systemic nature of anti-Semitism has forced Canadian Jews to question the continued vitality of the nation's Jewish communities, he said. Robertson said that the recent conflicts in Israel, first in May and June, then beginning on October 7th of last year, quote, make it abundantly clear when there's unrest in Israel, Jewish Canadians suffer unduly. About 1,200 people were killed in the Hamas-led attacks on southern Israel on October 7th, and about 250 people were taken hostage. According to Israeli figures, more than 34,000 Palestinians in Gaza have been killed during Israel's military response since then, health officials in the territory say. Um, B'nai B'rith is also saying uh, that it recorded a rise in anti-Semitic incidents coming from across Canadian society and from across a wide variety of actors, including figures on the far right and far left, and those acting at the behest of foreign actors. The incidents the group says it recorded include the firebombing of a synagogue and Jewish community center in Montreal, and we will mm. note that the leader of the official opposition voted against funding for a Jewish community center in Vancouver. Uh, the incidents also... While he was in Montreal at the time, right? Yes, at a, we don't know if he was at the Hanukkah event at when the time. He cast the, the vote specifically, but it was the same day and same time, and he was not in the House of Commons to do it because he was going there. Right. And of course, he was using that event as cover for a, so that people wouldn't say he wasn't in the House only to attend a fundraiser. So he basically exploited the Jewish community and their observance on that day. But he likes to pretend that uh, no other leader is more pro-Israel than him, which, which again is a lie. Um, yes, it is a lie. The incidents also uh, recorded eggs being thrown at a Holocaust memorial monument in Canada. We'll also remind you that uh, the leader of the opposition voted against funding for a Holocaust museum. Yes, he did. A Jewish student being assaulted in an, in an anti-Semitic attack in BC's Lower Mainland and a rise in anti-Semitic graffiti, graffiti in public places involving, mes involving messages such as kill the Jews. Do not do that. Do not do it, do not spray paint it, do not say it, do not think it. You're, of course, allowed to think what you want, but it would probably be best if you didn't think those things. Mm -hmm. Don't have that in your heart or your soul. And remember, it is not the people of Israel you need to protest. It's the government of Israel. Because and most of the people of Israel want nothing to do with Netanyahu or his policies. And it's certainly not Jewish Canadians that you should be protesting. No. Specifically, they don't have the power to do anything. And this is the thing. It's like, I, look, I get the protest. I get it. I, I understand it. But you're, you're screaming into the void. What can we do? What can Canada do to stop the war? There's really only one person now, that can do anything about it. Th th and they will say stuff like, for example, you could send messages by divesting. You could not sell offensive military weapons. You could not sell defensive military weapons. Mm -hmm. You could... Uh, sure. Agree. Yes. Yeah. Agree and then what? They'll just find another supplier. Well, find another supplier or you get your outcome mm -hmm. that Israel cannot no longer defend itself. And then what happens? Because from what I hear, again, this is not my field of expertise, but uh, from what I hear, it's not like if, if Israel stopped, it's not like the other side would abandon its desire to eliminate. Yeah. Right. You can't tell an entire people, you know, what you're doing is wrong, so leave yourself defenseless either. Right. There are huge protests going on in Israel right, right now. Yes. 53% of the Israeli public right now says that Netanyahu is screwing up big time. And you have to remember also that in Israel, because we keep on saying, right, Netanyahu's primary objective is to keep his own ass out of jail. Yeah. Yes. He has aligned with people that are even more militant, more violent, more right, more oppressive, more racist, more anything than he is. All of them are telling him, you make a hint of a concession to Hamas and we're leaving your government. 
which means he's no longer the prime minister, which means he has a chance to go back to jail again. The people who are worse than he is are keeping him on a short leash, and his primary concern is saving his own ass. And he doesn't care who gets hurt. Pretty much. So you got all these other considerations. It's like Even if you had the best student or activist protest against Israel, he would still have to convince the guy who's making the decisions that it's worth his own butt going to jail. And I don't know if you've been paying attention, but he doesn't seem to be really keen on that. Before October 7th happened, he was already being protested by the citizens of his own nation because he was trying to interfere with the courts. This is not this is a man that's not loved. No, not at all. He's not loved by the Palestinians. He's not loved by Hamas, clearly, but he's not loved by his own people either. And he's not particularly loved by his own government because uh, members in his own government are saying, you better do what we say or else we'll make sure you fry. So, um... That doesn't look like he's got to the respect and love of his own cabinet. This is not a good situation for anyone involved. There are no winners. There are no angels here. No. There are no angels here. Um, I was in Ottawa the last few days. Like I said, I, I passed by the encampment at the University of Ottawa. Uh, I have to say... There was nothing terrible going on. They're on the lawn of Tabaret Hall. There was tents. There were people sitting there. There were signs, but there was uh, no disruption. There was nobody uh, singing songs or uh, pitching slogans and all that kind of stuff. I did find one thing weird, though. Like yesterday, <laughs> I was walking around 11 o'clock at night, and I was there, and they were turning around saying, it was, last call for, which is like, Interesting that there would be like last call to buy, buy, buy beer around 10.30 on a protest that's pro-Palestinian considering that Muslims and beer don't really go to... <laughs> but hey, this is Canada. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know? um, but yeah, it all seems to be orderly. I guess if the University of Ottawa gave the, the, the same provision that, hey, listen... You know, we're, we're not particularly keen on this, but if you remain peaceful and you're not violent and you're not chanting anti-slogans and not impeding people's progress, um, I guess you're fine. Yeah. We wouldn't do this, but, and at least at the campus of University of Ottawa, that seems to be what there's done. There's no streets being blocked. There's no honking. There's no harassment. There was no, at least the couple of times over the last, you know, for uh, four, five, six days that I've passed by, everything seemed to be relatively peaceful and in order. They're just occupying space on the lawn in front of Tabaret Hall. They're occupying the whole lawn, which kind of means pretty much nobody else can use it. But that's about it. That's what's going on. So um, can't really do anything about that. And uh, I was listening to a, a chat between Dean and Max Fawcett yesterday, and it's like, um, Max Fawcett made the very important point that, that this is the time in your life when you're a student. You go to university, you try things, you 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 study, you 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 know align with causes, you explore different groups, you explore different activities, you make mistakes. This is the time you like do this, it. you're young and you're idealistic and you take strong, strong, strong positions. I mean, you have to understand right here that uh, the the thing that people are going with is that genocide is being committed. If you truly believe that genocide is being committed, it's kind of hard to soft pedal your passion to stopping genocide. Yeah, yeah, we should really stop genocide, but first let's get some brunch and let me do my hair. Said no one ever. It's genocide. So it's like, if you believe genocide is happening and you didn't raise your passions to 10 or 11, They kind of go with the territory, mm -hmm. but this is the time where you're, yeah, you're passionate and you're inflamed and you, you take positions and you say, yes, I'm right. And he says, well, what about this? No, I'm idealistic. I'm young. I am right. This is wrong. And I will stay here 
I will die on this hill. This is wrong. Then you get a little older and you realize all the subtleties and nuances and things are a little more difficult like this. But at that time in your life, that's when you're there. And creator be thanked for people that are passionate like that. Mm -hmm. Because often they do end up moving things along. Just by sheer will of conviction. I know that our fight for gay rights, there's probably a lot of people in the movement saying at the time, you know, oh, that'll never work. They'll never change. You're wasting your time. Don't put yourself at risk of violence or being bashed or whatnot. Like this and some of the kids that screw it, we're doing it anyway. Sometimes the kids are right. Yeah. Oh yeah. It just sometimes takes a little right. bit, you know, takes a little bit of work to get there sometimes. Sometimes. All right. But I wanted to make it clear that I was bringing this particular story because yes, we do like to talk about all sides of the aspect. Mm -hmm. And we do like to bring some real politic in it. And we do say things that disappoint the people that are more the more passionate. Mm -hmm. Why aren't you more all in? Why are you poo-pooing on this? We're not. Because we care about all of you. And we all want all of you to not be ultimately disappointed. So we're the and, party poopers that bring in real reality. We're the party poopers that you'll turn around and you go, oh, why do you always have to be right all the time? We're trying to be right. We're not trying to be right. No, matter. no. We're just saying... There is logic, there is reasoning, and if you take a step back from the impassioned, inflamed stuff, there are people, everybody has blind spots, and there mm -hmm. are blind spots you may not be seeing. And I just don't want people to believe in principles, to go to the barricades believing in principles that are not exactly so. Fair point. Because right? that's investing a lot of yourself in something that might end up having you run right into a brick wall and you're going, ooh, that hurts. I would rather you not get hurt. I don't want to curb your passion. I don't want to curb this. But there are certain things that people believe that when they go into protests or they go into advocacy work, that sometimes they're not exactly true. And then when things don't pan out the way that they had hoped for, they say, oh, this is just further more proof that things are rigged or against them. And sometimes, no, it's just that, you know what? Somebody misinformed you about what the law, the constitution or whatever else allows. And they set you up for disappointment. It happens. And I just don't want you to be disappointed. All right, Mr. Grizzly, do we have a show? We do indeed, sir. All right, kids and cubs. That's the end of this episode of the Daily Beaver Morning Show. We hope that you love listening to us because we love making this to you. Remember that sharing is caring and word of mouth is priceless. So please tell your peeps and poops all about us. Um, if you would like to uh, make sure that you do not miss an episode, you don't have to. Thanks to the Ray Girl. If you scan that QR code that's right under my chin, that will bring you to our pod page. That pod, that's podpage.com slash the true north eager beaver lowercase letters with the hyphen between each one of those words and uh, when you click subscribe there when we have something fresh off the bandwidth it will come directly to you uh, the qr code that was there before maybe mr grizzly will put it will bring you to our merch store which we recently unveiled uh, we have keychains we have caps and we have underwear so uh, make sure to put a beaver on your wiener <laughs> Ooh, phone cases water bottles tote bags gee we got everything. Socks. We even got a couple of Lola t-shirts available if you want to purchase. Oh, Lola t-shirts. Yay. Old school oh. uh, baseball style uh, tour shirts. Oh, I like that one. We've got uh, some athletic wear coming. I'm gonna. We're going to have everything we can possibly get uh, up, up and running as soon as possible so that if there's anything you want, mm -hmm. you're probably going to be able to find it on the merch store. So. Yeah. And eventually, hopefully, we'll have uh, different logos to some of our themed logos and stuff like that in case you want them for uh, yeah. occasions. I'll, I'll get to work on those. It's just a matter of yeah. time for me to put oh, yeah. them all together. Yeah, there's no, there's no rush. There's no rush. Um, but it's there. So there you go, uh, Kids and Cubs. Please, uh, if you want to uh, be sporting some uh, Eager Beaver merch, it is now there for you. If you would like to support us, then please, you can do that not only by going to our pod page, but by going to the True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated YouTube page, Make Like Kit Elaine, and go there, smash those buttons, like, share, and subscribe. They're waiting for you. It makes us very happy when you do, so please, please do that. I know Mr. Grizzly has been putting up some shorts as well to go there, so uh, anything that uh, you can do to tell your friends to get more people to subscribe, 
That would make us very happy. And if you'd like to uh, help us in another way, the QR code by Mr. Grizzly's Head, well, that will bring you to our coffee page. That's coffee, ko-fi.com slash eagerbeaver, lowercase letters, all in one word. And there you will find the emergency hydration fund or otherwise known as our tip jar. So if you would uh, like to leave us uh, a couple of dollars there, you think that we do a good show, you like the way we inform you, please leave some uh, a little bit there and uh, everything goes back into the show. So we appreciate everything you can do uh, to help us out there. If you want to write to us, truenorthegerbeaver at gmail.com, at trueeager on Twitter, truenorthegerbeaver on Facebook, uh, leave a comment on our YouTube page, uh, give us some stars and reviews if you're listening to us on Apple Podcast that we love all of that as well because democracy is something that you do please participate in the alberta ndp leadership race or uh, perhaps call elections saskatchewan or elections new brunswick and see if they are recruiting for uh, poll workers for the upcoming provincial election all right from the beaver lodge this is your eager beaver saying it could be a tough world out there so please be kind to and gentle with yourself mr grizzly do you have some words of wisdom for us well um We've said this time and time again, and I'm going to compete, complete. I'm going to repeat the statement: Be ever vigilant. Pay attention to who is getting elected to local as trustees in your local school board. Investigate what their policies are and why they have those policies, because these are folks. Not not every person, not every person that gets into a school board is ill-intentioned, but there are many. We're trying to, trying to penetrate the political sphere by entering through the school board as a trustee and changing rules like they just did in Manitoba, where they have overall judgment over who gets hired for drama or phys ed. We know who they're targeting. So don't let it happen to you. Don't let it happen to us. Don't let it happen to your community. Mm -hmm. Get out. Get loud. Make yep. the noise. And if you've got the time, run for something. If you can. Mr. Grizzly, please cue the cock. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors. The Miss V Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, their uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Pepper Master. Hot pepper sauce is made from farm fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. We are grateful to the Cryer Media Network for its support, Pete Jarvis for our artwork, and Paul Joseph something for our opening and closing sequence music. There's an opinion piece from Andrew Coyne in the Globe and Mail today. Yeah. <laughs> Paul, you have the business. Stop, su stop sucking up to liberals and start sucking up to me. Again. Yeah. An opinion piece, but from Andrew Coyne. He, he, he's not he been a fan much, of Skippy yeah. lately. Have you noticed no. that? No, he's not much a fan of him at all. Um, and uh, Kit's Cubs, uh, on the lighter side, yesterday was the 200th anniversary of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. Oh. On May 7th, 1824, it was performed for the first time at a theater in Vienna. The four movements were followed by five standing ovations at the time. It was his final symphony, and it was the first time a major composer had used vocalists. Of course, when we get to the Ode to Joy part. The manuscript is in the United Nations Registry of Humanity's Most Valuable Artifacts. And the final movement, the Ode to Joy, many people might know on this side of the border, but is the official anthem of the European Union. The lyrics were adapted from an 18th century poem about freedom and peace. Oh, wow. So there you go, kids. Joyful, joyful, we are joyful. <laughs> right. <laughs> go have okay. a, kids go and have a joyful day. I'll see yeah. you.